Hi, you're on an island floating in water. Pretty cool, huh? Most of it's animals. Fuck it, actually all of it's animals. You're the only human being in a universe of anthropomorphic animals, and you're the debtor to a tanuki who can build you a house on command. How did this happen? Animal Crossing was originally going to take place in dungeons and was in development for the N64DD. You were going to play as a helpless character to contrast the heroes of the more headline Nintendo games, but the 64DD was a flop, so now they have to work with the limited memory of a regular N64. This meant the game had to take a different direction, so this guy said, fuck the monsters, fuck the dungeons, fuck the story, leave, leave the animals. Please leave the animals. And what you get is an open-ended casual game that opened the door for a new genre. The game was unveiled at Space World 2000, and later released for the N64 in April of 2001 as a Japan-only game. The game sold okay, considering how late into the life cycle of the N64 it was released. It's still the 28th best-selling title on the platform. The game was stripped of its initial concept of enlisting the help of animals to tackle dungeons, fight monsters, and kill bosses, rather embracing the addictive gameplay loop of cooperation and goal completion. It sold well enough to be remade on the Nintendo GameCube just nine months later. On top of putting the game on a more modern console, it takes advantage of the new hardware by adding a lot of features that couldn't be packed into the N64. An internal clock, the museum, more bugs and fish, a tailor, new events, and a tropical island which houses new villagers and NPCs. All of this could be yours if not for one small thing. It's still a Japanese-only game. North America wants in on the action, so eight months later, Animal Crossing was released over there to great success. It localized a lot of events, characters, locations, and items to appeal to a new Western audience. Americans don't know what a shrine is, so that's a wishing well now. Tofu? No thank you. Clam chowder for me. The tomato juice shirt got redesigned. The success of Animal Crossing spread across the world, landing in Australia in late 2003 and Europe in 2004. In total, 2 million copies were sold, and Nintendo realized the potential in the series. Japan, who had gone a whole 18 months without an Animal Crossing game, got another region-exclusive title called Animal Forest E+. It's an enhanced version of Animal Crossing, retranslated back into Japanese with new content and e-reader capability, meaning you can scan these little cards of all the villages in the game. But that's dumb, and that will never be popular years down the line. These games are now grouped together and are generally regarded as the first generation of Animal Crossing games, despite differences in all of them. It's 2004 now, and Nintendo is ready for the next generation. The Nintendo DS is announced, and holy shit, it has Wi-Fi compatibility. Its visuals look very similar to Animal Crossing on the GameCube, but eventually it took up a form more similar to what we know today. A conscious effort was made to remove a lot of the region-specific aspects from the game to make it more appealing to a worldwide audience. For better or for worse, the game was stripped of many of its holidays, events, villagers, town features, and a lot of focus was put more so on multiplayer. The towns were smaller and the graphics were worse, but to fit this on a handheld system was quite an accomplishment, and it stayed very true to its predecessor in regards to gameplay, goals, collectibles, and dialogue. It didn't add much, and it even took away a lot, and yet was still a successful product. After releases in Japan, North America, Australia, Europe, and South Korea, it ended up selling almost 12 million copies en route to being the ninth best-selling game on the DS. And the public perception was pretty good too, putting the Animal Crossing franchise thoroughly in Nintendo's back pocket as not a headline title, but still good for selling some copies series. So, everything was looking good. Get the door! It's the Wii, Nintendo's hot new console. Motion controls are all the rage and everyone wants in on a piece of this action. Everything had a Wii game. Mario, Zelda, Madden, Need for Speed, Minions, Nerf. Animal Crossing was no exception. It was already being worked on before Wild World came out in sync with the development of the Wii. It was announced in 2005 as codename Animal Crossing Revolution. Yeah, really. Development was slow as Katsuya Iguchi was focused more on the R&D of the Wii. Nonetheless, in November of 2008, the game released. And it was... Fine. General consensus was that it didn't innovate much from the previous iteration, with the main appeal being the city and in-game shopping district. Outside of that, the game was seen as a graphically enhanced version of Wild World. It lacked great use of the novel motion controls, but made great use of the Wii speak that no one bought. Welcome to my town! It felt like a period of stagnation for the series, but that's not to say that it didn't sell well or wasn't generally liked. Both of those things aren't true. But there was a desire to shift the focus of the series to keep it fresh. Animal Crossing had relied on its open-ended replayability thus far and hasn't shifted shifted the focus a whole lot. The series needed a change. An ability to be more than a mortgage payer. I want to be the one who people pay things to. Like, in charge. I- and have c control over the design and make our towns made by us. 
This ideology came to mind about a year into the development of Animal Crossing Reincarnation. Okay, that's a lie. I made that code name up. But revolution was real, I promise. It gave the player the ability to enact ordinances, build public works projects, build bridges across water, and enhance the already much enjoyed casual aspects of the game by bringing in new villager species, new special characters, new collectibles, and new holidays. This is what would become of Animal Crossing New Leaf for the Nintendo 3DS. Released in Japan in November of 2012, it sold very well. So well, they said, ah, fuck it, the rest of the world can have it too. So the rest of the world got it in 2013, and it did just as well out there, becoming one of the best 3DS games sold, and even came bundled with a themed 3DS that year. Life was good, and the new outlook on the franchise seemed to have been a success. So much so that Nintendo made some cards. Well, these are useless. I wish these had a purpose outside of being novel collectibles. You can make a game out of this. Coinciding with Amiibo cards came Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer, a spin-off game focused on designing houses for your clients. This is the first of its kind, not being a mainline game. Clients can be summoned with Amiibo cards, and you can decorate their houses with all new UI that eventually made its way into the main game. Also unprecedented was DLC for existing games. Well, over three years after release, Nintendo drops Animal Crossing Welcome Amiibo, introducing a lot of cut characters from back in the day and a lot of crossover characters from other franchises. A campground was built, which utilizes Amiibo in the main game, and not just Happy Home designer. There's a new in-game currency, quality of life, design improvements, minigames, or fuck it, sell your town to fund a new one. It was well received, and combined with the base game, sold over 13 million copies. It seems as though Animal Crossing is in a good place, and nothing can go wrong. Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival was a video game. In the lull between mainline titles, Nintendo looked to expand into the mobile game market. What's the best way to mask a malicious loot box free to start mobile game into being aesthetic and cute? Animal Crossing Pocket Camp hit the market in late 2017 using assets from Animal Crossing New Leaf and City Folk. Its focus is different from mainline games where characters can manage a campsite filled with familiar characters from the series. While not being a mainline game, it had the added effect of boosting sales for New Leaf, bringing a large number of people into the Animal Crossing sphere. It no doubt partially led to the success of the next official title in the series, Animal Crossing New Horizons. The Nintendo Switch had been out for over a year by the time a Nintendo Direct was announced, teasing a new Animal Crossing game in the works. But it had been in development well before that, starting not long after the Japanese release of New Leaf. Early on, they had the idea of the game taking place on an abandoned island rather than in an already populated town. And with that came the decision to add crafting to the game to make the player feel like they're the ones building up this once abandoned island into something. The idea was carried over from Pocket Camp and became a large focus of the game. That and giving more control over the appearance of your island to the player and also yourself. This all came to light for the first time at E3 2019 where the game was initially pushed back from its intended release of 2019 to March of 2020. Nonetheless, fans were very excited for the game as it had been the longest span between official titles. Life was great and nothing could go wrong. Well, it's March 2020 now, and everyone's inside. Bored, alone, and looking for a distraction. Animal Crossing New Horizons releases right on cue and quickly became everyone's favorite coping mechanism. It brought together two things that people were desperately looking for at the time, a social simulator and a time killer, which is a lot of what the series had been already for so long, and it added on to that by being the first game that allowed players to have as much control over their world as they do. There's furniture, terraforming, moving buildings, pathing, all great ways to make the player's islands uniquely theirs. So whether it took a global pandemic or not, people finally realize the enjoyment in this series, and it now sits as the second best-selling game on the Nintendo Switch, thrusting it thoroughly from a mid-sized series into a premier franchise for Nintendo. But was it good? Or did it just capitalize on the market of people that needed it the most? It wasn't an unpopular opinion to think that the game initially was a downgrade from New Leaf. Drift-fed updates slowly patched in a lot of characters and events that fans were lamenting were missing at first. It's the first time in the series that the game relied on these small updates to make it into the final product. And when the update well ran dry, it looked like that was it. But wait, there's more. In tune with New Leaf receiving a major content update a while after the initial release, so did New Horizons, with Happy Home Paradise available worldwide in November of 2021. This coincided with the 2.0 release of the game that brought back most of what players were missing from the previous titles, and added a DLC similar to what Happy Home Designer offered to in the main game. It doubled down on the design focus shift in the series, allowing players to design getaway houses for villagers in the game. So, to review, animals. Me.